welcome to week two and today we're going to talk about gear. We're going to go real deep into the gear and let you know what you need to start out as a travel photographer. First up we've got the, the main camera which is the Sony a7 III. I chose this camera mainly because I'm a hybrid shooter or what you would call a hybrid shooter which means I shoot photography and videography and this camera really has good video specs and good um, photo specs as well. I really like, what I really like about this camera is it's got super, I think it's 426 autofocus points, I could be wrong. Um, it's really, really good in low light. It's got in-body stabilisation, which means I can shoot like a really low shutter speed handheld without, without needing my tripod. And also it's got really, really high quality video specs, which allows me to carry out the work that I need to do. So during my photography journey, I've owned four cameras. Um, my first camera was a Nikon D3200. I got that camera mainly because it was pretty cheap and I wasn't really clued up of what specs I needed. So I got that camera, I learned what I needed to learn and I quickly found that I'd outgrown it. But unfortunately, because I had a poor tripod, I was out shooting, trying to shoot the Aurora one night and um, it got blown over in winds. And unfortunately that camera died. Um, I then moved on to the Sony A6300 after watching some reviews on YouTube um, by a videographer called Christian Mata Grab. His name is, he's from Germany. And um, I was really impressed with that camera. Um, following on from that, I got a Canon 5D Mark II, I think it was, um, which was pretty good as well. Um, I like the idea of having a full frame camera just for my image quality. Um, but the Sony one was always calling me because just for the low light, so I decided to sell that Canon and get the Sony A7 III, which is full frame. And um, I'm glad I did, I've not looked back and it's really served me well. The Sony A7 III has a lot of custom functionality and a lot of customizable buttons. So the way I have my camera set up is there's a, function bu a custom button one on the wheel. I have this set to 4K video which allows me to quickly jump into video mode should I want to capture a video. Number two, set up for slow motion video. It's 1080p, but it's 120 frames per second, so that gets me that super slow motion. Again, I just click the wheel round and I can shoot video straight away. That's also, in, on each of those, my um, picture profiles are set up as S-Log3, um, so I don't need to, it's just instant. Switch onto the button and I can shoot. I don't lose any time having to set it up individually each time. I also have custom button one set to white balance, so I can quickly adjust my white balance if I need to. Custom button two is set up so that I can crop in. So the good thing about the Sony is, if you buy a lens that's not full frame, it automatically goes into crop mode, which will give you half of your sensor quality, or 1.5 times your sensor quality, but it still means you get to use a lens that isn't for your camera, but you still get the functionality of using it. So, and it also gives me the benefit, the benefit of See, I've got my 70 to 200 on. I can punch it in and get a uh, 300 mm maximum uh, focal length. So that's a wee cheat you can use. Um, when I'm shooting, um, I'm shooting predominantly aperture priority mode for the. That's it. When I'm out shooting photos, I mainly have my camera set in aperture priority mode. The reason I choose this is if I'm shooting one location and something happens to the right of me, which is a different lighting condition, if I turn, I'll be able to capture that instantly rather than having to adjust my camera settings in manual mode and potentially losing the shot. So that's helped me. A prime example of this was when I posted that Robin shot on Instagram. If I was shooting manual mode, I would have missed that shot because the Robin was only there for a split second. It literally landed in front of me. I, oh, to the right of me, I had to turn, quickly shoot, and if that was manual mode, I wouldn't have got it. Next, we're going to talk about lenses. Um, first up, we've got the Sony Zeiss 16-35 f4, which is a, this is a wide-angle lens. I tend to use this when I want to show how vast the landscape is to incorporate more of the shot and give a, a wow sense. Also, it can be used in tight alleyways to get more of the shot in as well. It really helps to showcase the image. So the reason why I've chosen the Sony 16-35 as my wide angle is because it has built-in optical stabilisation which is incorporated with the, 
the body of the, the A7 III really helps to get a, a steady shot, especially if you're shooting at those um, slower shutter speeds and at night. Next up, but we're actually using this lens on the camera to film me just now, is the Sony 2470 f2.8. This, this lens is my favourite lens and sits on my camera almost 24-7. I use this one the most just because it's a perfect focal range for landscapes because it's wide enough. But you can also punch in if you want to get something tight or show the scale and it's quite good for portraits as well. It gives you that shallow depth of field. Next up, we have the Sony Zeiss 55 f1.8. I really like this lens. Um, it's pretty compact as well. Um, it's good for doing some street photography. It's discreet, so it's not in your face if you're shooting in, out in the street. Also, being a 50, it's, it's pretty cinematic, especially if you're using video. Um, and the 1.8 gives you a nice depth of field. It's also really, really sharp. And again, the reason I chose this one, the autofocus is really fast. The, the 50 mm one, that's quite noisy when you're focusing, so um, it makes you can hear the focus motors turning, which again, if you're shooting video, it's not reliable. I'm not, um, it's not what you want because you can hear it. So this one's silent and really fast, and also it's pretty sharp as well. The last lens in my kit is the Sony 70 to 200 f/4. I really like this lens because um, it allows me to show off the scale of our location using the compression that gives you. The reason I've chosen the f4 over the f2.8 is because the f2.8 is pretty heavy and my bag's already heavy enough without that extra large lens and because I'm mostly, because I'm mostly shooting outside I don't really need the 2.8, um, f4 is sufficient. Um, I really like this lens because it's got the built-in optical stabilisation. You can turn it on and off if you desire. A good thing I like about this lens and all the other lenses is they come with a lens hood. So if if it's raining outside, you can put this on. It helps to protect your lens from raindrops, which is, can be quite annoying. You have to constantly wipe it with your lens cloth, but that hood helps to protect it against it and all the other lenses. It also helps cut the light um, from causing flares and stuff. When you're starting out, it's really expensive, so not everyone's fortunate enough to have a kit with multiple lenses. Um, the lens I would recommend you start off with, if possible, would be the one that's on the camera just now, the Sony 24. To 70 2.8. It's a very versatile lens and yeah you can do pretty much anything with it. Um, you can shoot landscapes, portraits, products, anything you wish. And it's a good lens to start out with and then as you progress you can slowly add more lenses to your collection as I did. Um, I didn't start out with this kit, I've gradually increased my kit over the years. Moving on we're going to talk about filters and what filters I carry with me when going out on my adventures. So I use the Lee filters, um, I'm really impressed with them. This is my variable ND filter, um, it's 72mm. The reason I've chosen 72mm is because that's the largest thread size I have for my lens. So a variable ND does what it says it does, it's a variable so it allows you to adjust the density of the, the lens, the filter. What this essentially is, is like a pair of sunglasses for your lens. So it, it reduces the amount of light coming through which allows you to work at lower f-stops or lower shutter speeds, say for instance you want to do a long exposure or if you're shooting video you can quickly adjust it if the lighting situation changes and you need to keep a specific shutter speed with your video or photo. Next up I have my polarizer or CPL as it's known um, which is essentially a pol polarizer. This is really handy to use when shooting like water or colours because when you adjust this it cuts the angle of the light and basically what this does is cuts off reflections from water, allows you to see through the water or it can make colours pop as well, like your greens in your image. I tend to use this more often if I'm shooting interior car work, um, it helps to cut the glare off the um, dashboard or if I'm shooting bottles such as my Eden Mill job I'm going to be doing, I'll, I'll adjust this and essentially that will cut the glare off the bottle and it helps to give you a more professional image. So next up we have my, what's known as the big stopper or essentially a 10 stop filter and this allows you to get really really slow shutter speeds um, during the day but otherwise you wouldn't be able to do it, your image would just be blown out. So what this is, is it reduces the light hitting the sensor by 10 stops which allows you to lower your shutter speed to say 25-30 seconds 
and allows you to get that milky water in your waterfalls or moving clouds or make you get the milky water of the ocean. What I also like doing is I buy the largest filter for the thread size for the largest lens that I have, which for me is 72mm. You can find your thread size on the front of your lens or sometimes the side, which is what you're looking for is a circle symbol with a line through it and then two digits. For me on here it shows 72mm. And then what you buy is, it's called a step ring. So this one goes from 49mm to accommodate for my 55mm onto the 72. You just, you just screw it on, which then allows you to put it onto this lower thread size. And then that fits your lens like that and allows you to create the long exposure with a different focal length on your camera. It saves you buying an uh, expensive filter multiple times and clogging up your camera bag. You just need the one uh, and multiple cheap step rings. Next up we have my camera strap. I use the Peak Designs camera strap, quick release. Um, it's really good because if you use the native camera strap you're tied um, to not being able to take it off as quick. Um, this one's really quick release so if I wanted I can snap it on. And you can also use this for stabilising. So if you hold it out, it gets you a real steady shot. Also when shooting low, it gives you more stability as well. You can do that technique as well. And if you wanted to ditch it to get a unique angle as well, you can quickly do that. Just pop it off. And this pouch is my spare batteries. So I carry four batteries. One in the camera and three spare ones. Now the Sony, the newer Sony batteries that come with the A7 III um, are really better, they hold their capacity longer, allows you to shoot more. Um, before when I had the A6300 I found my, myself having six batteries but now I've got four and that's more than enough. I've seen me just using two batteries in a whole weekend shooting, um, which I'm really impressed with with the, the Sony A7 III batteries. Um, as batteries can be quite heavy and also expensive so yeah I'm impressed with them. So moving on to SD cards, I now carry this case with four, five, six SD cards and also have two in the camera as well. The main two I use are V60 SD cards and um, these are really fast for writing, um, especially if you're shooting like continuous mode or burst, or burst as it's known. Um, you don't want to reach your buffer limit um, because it will clog up and then your camera will stop shooting. So if you're shooting something like a bird flying, you need to constantly shoot. When you hit that buffer, it will stop, especially if you've got a lower speed cab, uh, card. If you're using a higher speed card, um, you, won't, you won't hit that buffer as fast and allow you to continue shooting. Also, when shooting video, it's also important to know that the correct card that you need. Um, so, when I first started shooting video, I was using the incorrect card. Um, I was using V30 cards, and I found that my video was getting choppy or it would stop because what had happened was it had hit the buffer and stopped writing because it, it didn't have any more data. So the card you want to use for that is V60 um, or V90, but the trade-off with that is they're slightly more expensive. So when choosing your SD cards, um, it really is important to go with a trusted brand. You know you can trust them, um, also they have good data recovery tools and you basically get what you pay for uh, when, memory, uh, when choosing memory cards, so yeah. It's essential to use trusted brands such as Sony. Next up we have my tripod. This is quite a sturdy one. Um, when I first started out, I made the mistake of buying a, a rather cheap one from Curry's. I think it was 30 pounds. It was pretty much plastic. So, um, like I said, when my first camera died, it was because of this tripod. Um, I was on location shooting, trying to shoot the Northern Lights and doing a bit of astrophotography and it was a little bit windy. And unfortunately, um, that, that tripod was pretty light and it blown over um, in the winds. And unfortunately, that camera got damaged due to the poor decision of my tripod. So ever since then, I made sure I got a really heavy one, made of metal. It's pretty sturdy. And what I really like about this one is it opens up wide, gives you more stability and allows you to shoot low. You can go really low with it. and it's nice and compact as well. 
This tripod's pretty cool because it, it actually acts as a, a monopod as well. Um, you can use that for shooting help stabilise your shot or you can take it off and use it as a walking stick or a hiking stick. Also, if somebody tries to rob your bag, you can hit them with it. <laughs> you kind of put that in, but... <laughs> this tripod also comes with a, a quick release plate, which is handy for quickly um, taking it on and off the tripod uh, if you're in a hurry. You're not faffing about unscrewing stuff. You can just leave that on your camera and it essentially just clips into the tripod. It's one wee screw. And last but not least, uh, move on to my camera bag, um, which is the Low Pro Whistler 350 Mark II. It's a really sturdy bag. Um, it's waterproof to an extent and also comes with a, a waterproof um, cover. So it allows you to hike in the rain and not worry about your camera gear getting soaked and ruined. And it also has multiple attachments for like the tripod, water bottles. It's got clips you can attach extra stuff to, like tri uh, sleeping bags if you're going camping, tents, etc. Um, if you're a beginner and just starting out, I would recommend a camera body, the lens I suggested, which was the 24 to 78 or equivalent, um, an SD card, a reliable one, such as Sony, um, a battery, maybe an extra battery if you can, a tripod and a decent camera bag. Um, and as you progress and start to grow and enhance your skills, then look to adding in more lenses to try out different shooting and composition techniques. One important thing is always reinvest in yourself, so if you get that first job, don't spend the money on junk, uh, reinvest that money in improving yourself, whether it's you buy a course or something that's going to improve you, or buy newer gear, such as the lens you've always wanted, um, so it's really important to reinvest in yourself. My first tip for buying gear would be, make sure you do your research, whether it's on YouTube, um, look into that. Um, Bit of, bit of gear, whether it's a camera body, for instance. Say you wanted to go, and, you know, you wanted to do time lapses. Uh, look for a camera body that has that feature already built into it. Or if you wanted to shoot low light, make sure you pick a camera that's more suited for low light, such as the A7 III, or even an entry level camera such as the Sony A6300, which is the first Sony camera I, w I went to. Um, make sure that you do your research and find what suits you, so you don't have to again fork out so soon because it costs you more money in the long run if you do that. The next tip I have was when choosing, the next gear tip I have would be when choosing filters. Um, make sure you, I would recommend that you choose the largest filter size possible. If you know you're going to buy a larger filter later on, such as an 82mm, it's maybe a good idea to buy that 82mm filter and use the step rings. Again, that will save you money in the long run and saves you from buying multiple filters and it will free up room in your camera bag and also weight in your camera bag. Let's talk about planning. For this video, I've chosen to go to the Old Manor store and Melt Falls and also the Kerrang. The reason why I've chosen store is because it's so unique. The landscape is like a, basically a rock pinnacle sticking out the ground and it's pretty, it looks like an alien landscape. Also, we're going to head to Melt Falls because you can do some long exposures here and hopefully head to the Kerrang as well because you can get some nice leading lines of the road. It's really important to have a plan in place when going to these locations because they can be very treacherous if, not, if, if you don't plan. The way I plan my shots, I first do some location scouting on Instagram by searching hashtags of the location. That helps me find some nice compositions that I would like to try out. I then start to build a list of compositions I want to try and get on that location. I then head over to Google Earth and plan my route. I would then check the weather app to make sure when's best to go here. If it's nice weather, this would help determine whether I'm going to go for a sunrise shoot or a sunset shoot or a midday shoot, um, depending on the lighting. Having this plan in place allows you to maximise your time on the location, knowing where to go to get your angles and your shots, allowing you to create the most content available at a given location. Outside of the camera equipment, some important pieces to bring with you is footwear, hiking boots. Um, you stop you sliding all over the place, as I learned quite early on in my photography career, but don't wear trainers basically, because you'll fall. Also, waterproof trousers. These help, these help keep you warm uh, by not letting the wind cut through you, keep you dry if it's raining, and also they let you kneel down to get some low angle shots. 
Another piece of equipment that I like to have all the time is gloves, or a decent pair of gloves. Keep your hands warm because it can be quite cold. Also, um, I like to bring along a head torch with me. This one's, as you can tell, has been through the wars. Um, but it's quite a good bit of safety equipment to have because if you get caught out by the light dipping quickly, um, you can see where you're going on the way home, or the way back down to the car. Thank you very much for watching this gear segment and make sure you tune in next week when we're going to head to the Isle of Skye and we're going to hit up some epic locations up there, um, so don't miss it.